1905 and immediately began his life work painting the city. He got a job at the art gallery of Greater Victoria as a public publications officer where he stayed for five years and that was the beginning of, of a lifelong relationship with the art gallery of Greater Victoria. Robert has been a, vital, a vitally important part of the associate's annual house tour as artist, poster designer, and homeowner on the 2016 house tour when he and Sarah opened their home and studio. Elected to the Royal Academy of Arts in 1993, he became one of the city's best known artists. His paintings can be found in hundreds of private collections. His works are owned by the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, the City of Victoria, and the University of Victoria's art collection. For decades, Robert wrote about art in the Times Colonist and, Co and Monday Magazine. For more than 17 years, he visited Mount St. Mary's Hospital where he read to the residents well, they paint and draw. He's been an artist in residence at the Empress and the Oak Bay Beach Hotel, where he also wrote drafts of his E.J. Hughes books during breaks from two months of summer painting in a sunny room across from the David Foster Theater. Today, he's here to talk about his latest E.J. Hughes book, the E.J. Hughes Book of Boats. Robert. To work with and the sincerity of my purpose, uh, they have given Hughes Paints Vancouver Island. Uh, it came out in 2018 and it documents his work traveling from Sydney and Victoria all the way up to Courtney. The second book, which came out in 2019, is called E.J. Hughes Paints British Columbia, and it covers his student days in Vancouver, his trips up the coast, and uh, extensively his uh, travels across the province between Chilliwack and uh, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, the third book, which uh, came out last year, was called the E.J. Hughes Book of Boats, and it concerns itself with mostly the waters between Vancouver Island and the major part of British Columbia. It, Hughes is well beloved as a painter of boats, and this is a smaller book than the other two, less expensive, less technical, but full of all his most beloved pictures of every kind of boat on the coast. Um, just as we begin into the situation, I wanted to draw your attention to uh, uh, the fact that there are uh, two beautiful Hughes paintings on display in the art gallery at the moment. So when you go and see the exhibition of blue and white porcelain, which John Tupper just described, you'll also be in uh, the next door gallery where in the center of the room, this beautiful painting of the west coast of Vancouver Island uh, near Bamfield is on display. It's on loan, one of uh, three artworks on loan from the uh, Denham Kelsey family, formerly of Thetis Island, who uh, befriended Mr. Hughes in his last days and made a very good collection of Hughes paintings. But to take us back to the biographical material, Hughes uh, here is pictured in 1961. Uh, he was born in North Vancouver, uh, but his family was actually from Nanaimo. And after, uh, shortly after his birth, his mother took him back to Nanaimo where uh, his uh, father was uh, working. His father worked in the uh, coal mines there, uh, worked above ground as a timekeeper, uh, but really at heart was a professional musician. He was known as the best trombone player in the province and played in uh, orchestras in the theaters, both in Nanaimo and also later in the Orphea in Vancouver. Anyway, Hughes uh, spent the first 10 years in Nanaimo and then the family moved to Vancouver. And uh, after uh, growing up in North Vancouver, uh, Hughes uh, enrolled at the age of 16 into the Vancouver School of Art, which was pretty well a new institution at that time. He enrolled in 1929 and uh, continued his studies until graduation in 1933. But the prospects for an artist to make a living in 1933 were very poor. 
And so he was retained by the school as a kind of a postgraduate artist emeritus at the school. He was recognized really as probably the best young artist in Vancouver uh, at the time. Uh, he had studied with uh, Fred Varley at the College of Art and with Jock MacDonald, uh, but really his uh, old fashioned style owes more to Charles H. Scott, the principal of the school. After graduation, it was a kind of hopeless case, as I said, for an artist to make a living. And Hughes thought maybe if he made small prints, he could sell them inexpensively and find some way to get along. And this is a dry point engraving. It's about the size of your hand and was made on a sheet of copper. He scratched in the drawing with a phonograph needle and then printed it off on a printing press he was allowed to use at the school. He figured he could uh, sell these prints for $2 and uh, find a way to make a living, but uh, there weren't very many takers. Uh, certainly, though, they were beautiful prints. This is the Harbor Princess. Uh, in 1937, uh, at which time he had, had finished his school days uh, but didn't have much to do, he was uh, sketching in Stanley Park, drawing a grove of trees near Second Beach, when a young woman uh, walking her grandmother's dog uh, stopped by and uh, timidly uh, asked if he would mind if she ha had a look at what he was doing. And uh, he was charmed, charmed by the fact that a young woman stopped to talk to him and uh, charmed by the fact that she had the graciousness to actually ask for his permission. Uh, they struck up a conversation and uh, shortly fell in love. And in uh, 1940, uh, they were married. Her name was uh, Fern Smith. And uh, Fern was really the only woman in his life uh, from that moment in 1937 up until her death in uh, 1974. This is the first drawing he did of Fern. And it is truly a beautiful, beautiful drawing. The uh, let me just adjust things here. I want to move that there uh, so that I can show you uh, up close and in what detail, what a sensitive and exquisite draftsmanship this young Vancouver artist was capable of. I don't think you could find a more beautiful drawing in a museum anywhere in the world, whether it be Angre or Leonardo da Vinci or whoever else you might choose. Let me get down now. Now we need to come to the next one. Um, but the prospects were not good for an artist, as I've said, even though Hughes was acknowledged to be the just about the best artist in Vancouver, there was no way to make a living. And in 1939, in a rather desperate uh, straits, he decided he'd uh, give up trying and, uh, and join the military, where he could be assured of a place to sleep and being properly fed. Uh, maybe he didn't notice when he signed up on the 31st of August, 1939, but war was declared four days later. Uh, he was uh, trained in Victoria at Fort Macaulay uh, as an artillery man and uh, subsequently uh, was uh, stationed in late 1939 at Stanley Park a Battery. Uh, around about that time, he had gotten the notion that he would like to be a war artist. His teacher, Fred Varley and uh, Charles H. Scott at the School of Art had both uh, been in the First World War and Varley had a very, uh, as a war artist, it had really uh, marked his life. So Hughes knew that there was such a thing as a war art program and he began lobbying uh, the government federally and the government army headquarters to be made an official war artist. There was no war art program though. 
and his letters were uh, set aside for at least a year until finally uh, his intentions were noticed and he was taken on as one of three service artists in the Canadian army. There was no war art program at that time, but he was one of the very first who was named to the task. And he went to Ottawa. He worked for a year and a half in Ottawa, drawing uh, diligently uh, training opportunities at Camp Petawawa and at the Connaught Rifle Ranges. In uh, spring of 1942, uh, he and two others were sent to England to work on the south of England. This was just after the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. And Britain was imminently anticipating the invasion of the German troops. And the British forces had been terribly decimated uh, by the Battle of Britain. And uh, subsequently, the Canadian forces in the south of England were really on the anticipated front line of an invasion which could have happened at any time. Hughes worked morning to night, uh, drawing and painting the details of this uh, wartime activity. And uh, this is a major part, the subject of my next book. Um, after a little more than a year in England, he was uh, brought back to Canada and was posted between uh, the, in the winter of 1943-44 into Kiska, which was part of the Aleutian campaign. This was a, not a well-known situation, but the Aleutian Islands uh, extend from the coast of Alaska almost all the way to Japan. And the Japanese had the temerity to invade the closest of the Aleutian Islands, an island called Kiska and another called Atu. The American forces weren't having any of this and they mounted a great offensive and the Japanese. And then in late 1943, an occupational force of Canadian and Americans uh, uh, assembled at Kiska and stayed there uh, to defend it against an inv uh, repeated the invasion, which never happened. It was a terrible situation for artists to work in. It was uh, snowbound uh, winter and uh, darkness. Hughes was the only artist there uh, in among many, many thousands of soldiers and uh, made an extraordinary uh, documentary record of his time there. He returned to Ottawa and finished his service he was uh, assigned the job as administrator of the artist's studio, the war artist's studio in Ottawa. And because of that position, he had to remain until all the other war artists had been demobilized. He was not allowed to, go, to leave his service until October, 1946. So you can see he was the first war artist. He was the last war artist. And he was the most prolific of all the war artists, leaving more than 650 artworks, uh, which are now housed in the Canadian War Museum. As I say, that's the body of work which will form my next book. When he came back from the war and uh, rejoined his life with Fern, they came to Victoria to live with his parents and uh, this painting called uh, Fish Boats, Rivers Inlet, was the first painting he made when he came back. He never ever painted another war subject. He reached back into his earlier life to, for subject matter, but the darkness and the danger visible in this image is, I believe, directly attributable to his war service, the individual in his, single boat in the choppy waters by night. Uh, it was not a happy time for Hughes. In fact, it took him about 10 years before he overcame this oppressive darkness in his work. This is a, one of the, the pictures from that same time. It's a picture of St. Paul's Church on the North Shore of uh, Vancouver, North Vancouver. So in the Indian reservation there and a uh, powerful and beautiful painting it is. But 
exhibiting that great darkness that came over him. Well, slowly, with a return to life with his beloved wife and uh, his, his family in Victoria, uh, things began to clear up a little bit. Uh, there was a great stroke of bright light in 1947. Uh, as you may know, Lauren Harris the, of the famous Group of Seven was the executor of Emily Carr's estate. And he had arranged for Emily Carr's work to be sold through his representative, the Dominion Gallery in Montreal. And after Emily died in 1945, the work which remained in her estate, which was not given to the province of British Columbia, was sold through the Dominion Gallery to great acclaim. And the money which was achieved through selling Emily Carr's paintings was used to create a scholarship fund. And Lauren Harris gave the Emily Carr scholarship in 1947 to E.J. Hughes. Uh, Hughes took the, a trip in 1947 on, on a steamer up to Prince Rupert, but he didn't really find traveling on a steamship was good for painting. A number of reasons, not least of them being that he got seasick. But he kept the remainder of the scholarship money. And in 1948, he spent the summer traveling up the east coast of Vancouver Island. First of all, at Sydney, which is this uh, painting of uh, uh, car ferry, or, uh, one of the princess ships, Princess Victoria, and a little car ferry uh, on the waters off Sydney. Uh, he uh, subsequently went further and further up the island. He took uh, stops at Ladysmith for a couple of weeks, uh, then up to Nanaimo for a couple more weeks, and finally as far as Courtney. This is a painting from, uh, I believe it's 1962, which was uh, based on a drawing he did from the Malaspina Hotel in Nanaimo. Uh, Hughes, as you should know, really did not paint pictures on location. It was his habit to make very careful drawings, very patiently and slowly. He'd spend days making drawings, which he would then annotate in great detail with notes about the colors and tones. Then he could take these drawings back home to his studio and days, months, sometimes many, many years later, recreate the images as fully realized oil paintings. This one is a painting of which he expressed that he felt was the, his favorite painting of all the paintings he ever did. It was used as a poster for Expo 86 to great acclaim, our World's Fair here and uh, is truly beloved. The art gallery owns a painting which is very similar to this of the steamships at the Old Wharf in Nanaimo, which is really one of the treasures of our gallery's collection. Uh, on that same trip though, uh, while he was uh, heavily under the influence of his wartime experience, he painted this uh, picture of Qualicum Beach. Uh, he was uh, perfectly capable of highly naturalistic renderings of anything he chose to, but he had learned in the last years of his war service that for his paintings to show up in the exhibitions of wartime art, they needed to be much stronger in composition and much bolder in their tonality of uh, light and dark contrasts. And so he assumed a false naivety, a kind of primitive style, uh, which was influenced by the Mexican muralists and by the uh, French painter uh, Henri Rousseau. Uh, so although this painting is based on a beautiful and highly realistic drawing, which I've included in my book, uh, in fact, the painting itself with the uh, waterline uh, vertical and the figures seen against uh, such dark backgrounds 
uh, owe a lot to his wartime experience. I've always felt these people standing out in the water are uh, suffering some sort of existential dread. Uh, it's very much a war, uh, a wartime painting, although it, he never indicated it that. Uh, he, as he went further up, he uh, went to Courtney, he painted the log dump at Royston, he painted the main street of Courtney, uh, and this picture from what is called Back Road over on the Comox, is that right? Comox side of Courtney, uh, looking back towards uh, the Forbidden Plateau. Such a beautiful painting. This one belongs to the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, might be a good time to mention, uh, Hughes was very much helped by the Emily Carr Scholarship, but he and his wife were still impoverished. They didn't have any way forward. And in an effort to save money, they sold up the little house they owned in Victoria and moved to Shawnigan Lake. Also, he liked things to be very quiet. He couldn't stand any a a noise or activity around him. He found it very distracting. So they went to Shawnigan Lake, but there was no art scene in Shawnigan Lake. And the chances of him establishing a career there were pretty well zero. I mean, he'd almost never sold a painting in his life. But one day, something miraculous happened. The owner of the Dominion Gallery, Max Stern, came from Montreal. And he came to Vancouver and met with Lauren Harris. They were at the faculty club at UBC having lunch. And Stern said to Lauren Harris, you know, that deal with Emily Carr really worked out well. Are there any other artists we should know about? And Harris looked over the shoulder of Max Stern and saw Hugh's painting of Fish Boats Rivers Inlet, which was on loan to the UBC faculty club. And he said to him, Ed Hughes, he's your man. So Stern came to Victoria and it took him three days to track down Hughes because Hughes had left without a forwarding address. Eventually the RCMP and a writer for the Times colonist, Gwen Cash, got in on the hunt and they tracked him down to Shawnigan Lake. I like to imagine that Gwen Cash and Dr. Stern uh, came down the road beside the lake and uh, up the front steps at Hugh's house. You see, they had no telephone. There was no way to send a letter to him so quickly. They uh, came unannounced and uh, knocked on the door and introduced himself. I'm Max Stern from Montreal. I'd like to see your paintings. Well, Hughes showed him what he had and Stern in short order said, I like what you do. I'd like to buy it all. And he sat down by the kitchen table and wrote out a contract by which he bought everything Hughes had at home. He paid him $500. He bought 13 full-size oil paintings and 35 watercolors, drawings, and prints. Oh, well, many people have thought this was a terrible deal because almost all of those 13 paintings would sell for more than a million dollars these days. But on the other hand, he was extremely grateful to him because Stern bought everything. And he said to his wife a few weeks later, uh, this is something Hughes told me when we first met in 1993. He said, you know, I said to my wife, Fern, wasn't that marvelous that that man from Montreal came and bought all those paintings? And she said to me, Ed, you don't understand. He wants to buy everything. You just have to send it to him. And from that time on, everything Hughes painted was sent to Montreal and a check came back by return mail. This was a contract that was in effect from 1951 until Stern died in 1988, and it was continued by his successors until the Dominion Gallery closed in the year 2000. For half a century, everything Hughes did was sold as soon as completed to a gallery in Montreal. And Stern in Montreal sold on Hughes paintings immediately to the most prestigious collections in the country. 
both the National Gallery, the Montreal Museum, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Vancouver Art Gallery, and uh, Department of Foreign Affairs to collectors in Germany and in Holland. It was extraordinary. And in return, Hughes just wanted to be left alone. He never attended the opening of any exhibition of his work. And uh, except for uh, very collegial letters back and forth with Dr. Stern, he had no correspondence at all. He just lived quietly at home with Fern and continued his painting. And these paintings take a long time and a great deal of concentration to achieve as I'm sure you can understand by having a close look at them. It's interesting to observe now, I've made a habit of traveling to all the locations which Hughes painted and trying to photograph the subjects and the discrepancy between photographs and what Hughes actually painted is enormous. We look at them and feel we recognize them immediately, but uh, that's uh, not what it's like to a camera, I can tell you. Anyway, here's Seanigan Lake. This is the view from Old Baldy Mountain and Hughes House. I don't know if you can see my, can you see my cursor running around on the picture? Good. Hughes uh, House was just right here on the shoreline at, at the bay. This is uh, uh, on the uh, east side of Seanigan Lake, uh, 1.2 kilometers south of the uh, village of Seanigan. Uh, there's a picture of Fern. By 1958, a uh, number of uh, good things had happened in his career, and Hughes was able to afford his first car. He got a driver's license at the age of 45 years old and bought a secondhand Pontiac. And uh, he and Fern were ever so happy to have a way to get out into the countryside so that he could go off and do his paintings without having to make miles and miles of hiking. Uh, they also, uh, it, just previous to that, had bought a little tiny boat. It had a one-cylinder engine, uh, and with that they could go from their home up to the Shawnigan Lake store, which was something they did once a week. Uh, Fern was suffering from muscular dystrophy and was unable to make the track up to the store. Uh, so with this boat, they could actually go together and uh, get their shopping done. This painting uh, is owned by the National Gallery of Canada. Uh, in uh, 1956, uh, Stern received word of a commission available uh, for an artist to travel on this ship. It's a small oil tanker called the Imperial Nanaimo. Uh, the Imperial Oil Company wanted to have an artist travel with them up the coast to make paintings to illustrate a magazine story in their company magazine, The Lamp. And Hughes went off for two weeks on the Imperial Nanaimo and sketched waterfront communities of an industrial sort all the way up the inside passage. These uh, paintings uh, were very lucrative for him. Not only did he sell all the paintings to the Dominion Gallery, but he was paid handsomely for the reproduction rights uh, used in the magazine. Uh, also, he used this subject matter for the rest of his life, uh, such beautiful subjects. Um, I was telling you that it was his habit to uh, draw the pictures rather than uh, paint on location. This is a drawing he made on the shore close to his home. It's at Maple Bay, just down from what was called the Brigantine Pub. And you can see he's drawn with a pencil with great care and diligence and annotated the colors and the tones in great detail. His uh, patience and ability to draw these things uh, never wavered. This is in fact his own photograph that I'm showing you and you can see he has thumbtacked the drawing down to a worn out old piece of cardboard. This is in preparation for uh, rendering it as a painting in watercolor, in this case in 1963. 
And it, it, I don't know, uh, by now, maybe I'm becoming very uh, uh, overly familiar with his paintings, but they seem so correct and so true of this place we live in that you can't believe that they should be any other way. And yet, you know, as the art critic here for very many years, I can tell you there aren't any other artists who paint this way. There aren't people who show us where we live in such an honest and straightforward way without any uh, romantic uh, uh, haze across them or uh, photographic uh, uh, intervention. This is just what it's like to be there. Uh, I did mention in, uh, in 1956, uh, he took his uh, first trip across the province. He hadn't got a car yet, but he and his uh, wife Fern went to Chilliwack on the bus and stayed in a motel for two weeks. And he painted a lovely series of paintings of the farm scenes at Chilliwack. The Art Gallery of Greater Victoria owns one of these Chilliwack paintings. Uh, which is the uh, mountains of the Cascade Range, just uh, south side of the uh, American border. Uh, here, here's a picture up at uh, Lillooet, uh, showing you his uh, wonderful approach to the, to the mountain passes. He uh, certainly was always on the lookout for water to paint, even in the dry lands of the interior of the province. Uh, Another view of uh, Bamfield. He only went once to the West Coast. It was the first trip he took after he got his car in 1958. He drove out to the end of the road at Bamfield and then uh, hiked to the shore at Breaker Beach. Uh, he went out most every day for a couple of weeks and made a battery of sketches and drawings there, which resulted in really sublime pictures of the West Coast. It's hard to believe though, he only ever went once and yet painted these subjects for the rest of his life in a way which is uh, unforgettably accurate. Uh, as the uh, time went on though, uh, he had less and less interest in traveling. He just wanted to stay home and uh, he lived in uh, Shawnigan Lake until it became impossible for Fern to uh, handle a two-story house up a hill uh, away from the village. Uh, and so uh, they moved to uh, Cobble Hill, uh, where Fern died in 1974. Uh, Hughes, uh, shortly thereafter, moved to Duncan and Heather Street. I think I can show you a picture of his house shortly. Uh, but uh, from that time on, he never was away from home even overnight for the sketching he wanted to do. Every four years, he would block off a couple of months and make uh, tours to places to draw the drawings which he would subsequently use for his paintings. Uh, in this case, he liked to park in the visitor's parking lot over the Crofton Mill. He loved to paint ships. Uh, this is a little ferry boat coming from Salt Spring Island to Crofton. And here is the trop wood uh, with a great uh, scene of uh, operations on the wharf. It's funny, you know, we, we tend to stand back and think of him as a landscape painter. But if you actually look into his paintings, as I am in the habit of doing, and you realize that he was quite as happy to paint forklift trucks and to, uh, to uh, consider the people working around on the docks and uh, what the day of the working man's life was like, there's a, he, didn't, he didn't edit reality to make a romantic vision of it. He painted what was directly in front of him. And although they look like uh, uh, modern up-to-date pictures, uh, as I was doing the book of boats, I realized that in fact, he was recording history, which is already gone from us. He painted all those lovely old steamships and princess ships, but they were a thing of past by the began painting them. And he painted the car ferries when they were brand new. He didn't mind that they weren't as graceful and elegant as the steamships. They were just what was in front of him. And it was a serious and sincere look at where we live 
these landscapes with the hillsides and patches of bareness and, uh, and rock. And what's on the shoreline? Uh, I mean, what is this? A, a, a upturned wharf uh, washed up on the shore and covered with barnacles? Um, whether it be the distant mountains or the barnacles on the shore, it was all good for him. Whatever was in front of him was quite interesting. I'd like to say also, I think this is the most beautiful painting of an arbutus tree ever created. Just love the way that looks. Uh, but as I say, uh, it could be arbutus tree, it could be an overpass on a bridge or a highway, it uh, might be the telephone wires. I mean, how <sighs> most artists would not have painted quite so many telephone wires in their pictures. And the pleasure he obviously took in the uh, guardrails and the two lane asphalt uh, is uh, quite uh, visible. And even the vegetation and gravel and weeds down by the side of the road, every bit of it is treated with a loving attention. And every one of these pebbles is painted with the same loving attention. It never wear, varies. I often think of him as a kind of a Zen master. His ability to concentrate and to not become distracted or start thinking about other things, but just to focus on what he was doing uh, is a marvel to me. In this picture also, you might notice all these people along the shoreline. Uh, it's my belief when you get a good close look at them that every one of them has a biography and a life story. He's the painter who just never stops. It's a painting of uh, just off Gabriola Island. And a painting from uh, Maple Bay looking towards Mount Maxwell on Salt Spring. I had a letter from a forester not long ago who was uh, appreciating uh, my book about Hughes on Vancouver Island, and he gave me a description of the history of the logging and planting of every one of these cut uh, blocks along the shoreline. He, he really appreciated the fact that Hughes did not edit out the lumbering activities on this coast. Uh, again, uh, Crofton and the shoreline. I mean, it's all beach logs, but when you think of it, this is the detritus of industrial extraction, isn't it? These logs have been cut and washed up on shore. There's milled lumber. This is all the industrial age and in the industrial age, which is is gone now. Well, uh, I do want to show you a picture of Pat Salmon uh, holding up one of Hughes' latest paintings. Whenever Hughes painted a picture, uh, finished a picture, uh, Pat would photograph it for him, and then he might photograph her holding the painting, but he always had enough respect for her to photograph her entirely as well, and made a record of the lovely dresses she habitually wore. Uh, as I say, he lived very modestly, although by this point, he had more money in the bank than he knew what to do with. He had no interest or taste for luxury. The only extravagance he allowed himself was a nice big car. And in this case, he had a Jaguar XJ12. Uh, he was past driving at this point, but he liked to keep it in the carport because he liked the way it looked. The first time I went to visit him here, I had to drive around the block a couple of times. I couldn't believe he was living in such a modest house, but it didn't bother him. There's a Ed in the living room of his house. He's got a record player and a bunch of big band jazz records. Uh, the walls are a uh, photo grain wood finish and the, the carpet is the same disgusting 1960s shag that was there when he moved in. But he was a bachelor and he painted in the back bedroom and he liked things just the way they were. In his whole house, there was only one of his artworks on the wall. And that was the drawing of his wife, which he did before they were married. 
Everything else, as soon as it was finished, was sent to the gallery and sold off to the most impressive collections in our country. Well, there's Pat driving Ed in the Jaguar over the Mala hat and looking back at Finlayson and Arm. It's lovely smile in his face, his uh, sparkling blue eyes, neatly trimmed mustache, always wearing a shirt and tie and his tweed jacket. He was a, a figure of a renown at the Doghouse restaurant in uh, Duncan, where he used to eat lunch on a regular basis. Uh, people recognized him as a, he was known as a famous artist, but until recently, uh, people on Vancouver Island, where he lived, had really almost never seen any of his paintings because they were all sold immediately out of Montreal to the most impressive collections in the country. This is the last painting he created. This is looking back towards his days as a gillnet fisherman in 1937 at Rivers Inlet. But here's that little fish boat and it's just coming into the wharf at the very end of a long, long journey. And heaven knows that wharf is a pretty rickety old structure, but the boat is gonna definitely make it into the home port. So with that, I think I've probably used up all my time and I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and I'd be pleased to uh, engage any uh, questions you might have. Robert, it's Peter. I have yeah, a, hi, Peter. When you were showing the, the painting done in the Comox Valley, you said that you went and photographed these sites and that they were different. So what, what was different from the photo? Was it just that time had gone by or what? And, and uh, well, that is that makes it hard to, to find the exact location because the trees have typically grown up and the road system changed and uh, subdivisions have been built in. But the more dramatic change is uh, a way in which he kind of telescopes uh, the distance so that things are much closer than they appear to when you're standing on the hillside. Things are much closer. And uh, this uh, painting I'm showing you is a painting of uh, Revelstoke. And uh, in fact, when you look at the painting, you can see uh, every little road and every little house and every little uh, uh, you know, back shed and bush. But in fact, there are vastly more houses and roads than this in Revelstoke. And it's at such a distance from you that you can barely make out uh, anything except perhaps the dome of the city hall. But he has uh, very much simplified these things and uh, brought them into uh, bright colors and tonal contrasts. It's as if it was a toy model of the town itself. And in some, he, he tended to like the, uh, he did a number of townscapes from an aerial viewpoint. This one was done from the, from the Nels Nelson ski jump, which is now a park uh, above Nelson, above Revelstoke. Uh, but, uh, it, the, the whole thing is vastly more spacious when you're there. His view of it was he internalized the whole thing. He drew it, he, drew, he sketched it in the first place, and then he made a drawing of it uh, in a complete tonal rendering of it. And then after that, he painted the oil painting of it. So. The, the, it's funny, they, they give you a terrific sense of recognition, but when you go and compare them with reality, you find out he has uh, hugely uh, uh, absorbed and reinvented what it was he was seeing. Robert, my name is Don Jones. I've been yeah. wondering where he got his uh, Robert, I was... Um... Sorry. Oh, I think I think Dawn is in the middle of a question, and Dawn. then Joan. Okay. Yeah. Hi. 
Um, I've been wondering when he lived in isolation on, on Shawnigan Lake, how and where did he get his paints from? He certainly wasn't going into the town to buy them. Um, I think he'd probably get them in Duncan. Ah. Um, the kind of paint, he, he also, I mean, he could, uh, uh, presumably the uh, Vancouver would have been able to supply him with anything he needed. Uh, and uh, if, if he asked for something, Stern would supply it for him. In fact, he painted a person and he needed large canvases and crates and Stern provided the materials and sent them to him. Uh, they had long discussions about the kind of varnish he was using and uh, Stern's art conservators at the gallery uh, sent Hughes what he needed for that. But his, materially speaking, I think that uh, the, 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 his palette was quite simple and he always used, uh, you know, the, the most popular name brand paint. It was probably all Windsor and Newton oil paints. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't too difficult to get them. He didn't. Uh, he, I say he lived in isolation in Shawnigan Lake. If he needed to crate up one of these paintings, I mean, these paintings may have been four feet across and he'd have a crate built for it and then uh, take the train from Shawnigan Lake uh, into Duncan and go to the post office and have it shipped away. So he wasn't uh, in utter isolation, but he preferred not to have any uh, social contact, really. Right. Thank you. Joan, Robert, do you have a question? Joan Hazar. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, fascinating. Thank you. I, I, you know, love his stuff, and it's, it's a great new take on it for me. But I'm curious about um, your thoughts on the relationship he had with, with Max Stern on the Dominion Gallery. Uh, I understand the plus of buying everything and selling it on, but do you think Stern took advantage of him? Um, that is a question which has been asked again and again over the years, and uh, it does keep coming up. And I would categorically say, no, Stern didn't take advantage of him. Stern. Uh, certainly knew a good thing when he was on to it at the start, but Stern constantly upped the prices every time around. And when he got a particularly nice painting, he'd send him a bonus too. Okay. And many times he said to him, just tell me what you need, Ed. You tell me what it should be. Hughes was appallingly modest in his requests for money. He didn't right. want to, but I'll tell you something that will strike a chord locally, and John Tupper, pay attention to this. A group of businessmen in Victoria in the late 60s approached Colin Graham at the gallery, and they said, we think Hughes is getting ripped off by Stern, and we've formed a consortium, and we want to buy him out of the contract. We'll pay him much more, and we'll take it, we'll take it over. So they delegated Colin Graham to go to Shawnigan Lake and put this offer to, to Hughes. The, they were, they were going to uh, make a new contract for much more money. And uh, Hughes wouldn't hear of it. He didn't, he didn't entertain it at all. Um, the fact is that Hughes really appreciated what Stern had done. Stern was unfailingly honest and very gracious and also Stern often had in their correspondence from, from like in one of the first, in 1951, in the first year of their contract, Hughes had sent a painting of a uh, car ferry at City, which uh, uh, he sent it to him and Stern sent the painting back. And he said, I think you should cut two inches off the top of the painting. He said, I'll pay you $10 for your, I'll pay you $10 for your trouble. <laughs> so Hughes, without a word of complaint, did as he was bidden and sent the painting back to Stern, who immediately sold it to the National Gallery. You know, and this, this type of comment, like Stern would say to him, I noticed that you've got the foreshore coming in from the left and coming in from the right, and they overlap. He said, I think it would be better if they didn't overlap so that we could see through to the horizon. 
You know, these, this was a kind of artistic advice, which Hughes had nobody to talk to about art. Fern didn't know anything about it. He didn't have any artistic friends. There was nobody in Shawnigan Lake. So he, he needed someone who could advise him, who had another, another sight of what was going on. And Stern was nothing if not astute. That man had a good eye. He had a brilliant career as a gallerist. And uh, uh, Hughes really appreciated it. And he never wanted to change a thing. They only met, I believe they met three times in the course of their uh, long, long, long uh, career together. But uh, Hughes always appreciated what he did. So he didn't feel he was being taken an advantage of. In fact, uh, as I said, he had more money in the bank than he, he, he knew what to do with. He, he, didn't, he didn't want anything. He just wanted to paint. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I don't Robert, know. where are your books available? The books are available in all bookstores. They're, they have, they've met with a really good success. In fact, they've been on the BC bestsellers list constantly since they were published. If they're You'll find them anywhere. At, at Monroe's, at Boland's, at Ivy's. And the gallery shop. Don't forget the gallery shop. Yep. Where I think Louise might have been about to say that we get a 10% discount members, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Joan? Robert, thank you. This has been just so, I mean, it's always a joy to hear you talk because you talk really well. You do your your knowledge is extensive and it comes through to us. And giving us this view into this particular aspect of Hughes has really been a joy. Thank you so much for organizing this and and bringing your vision to us. Thanks. Well, it's a pleasure, and I hope you'll invite me back to talk about any other subject. We've uh, 